Our first guest today is Tony Simon. He is a Second Amendment rights advocate and the founder of The Second Is For Everyone. Two A Four E, beautiful branding. Uh, something that that I first heard from from our mutual friend Ernie Hancock. And this, the the, the angle that you're taking with this, Tony, is truly beautiful. Uh, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thank you for having me on. Um, I find it funny that you say you're old core. We're <laughs> 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 oh, oh, oh. oh. yeah, here. If your 782 gear wasn't chainmail, you ain't old core, right? Okay. What what's what's your what's your background there, Tony? Uh well, I mean, just to do the Marine Corps reference, yeah, I joined the Corps 17 back in 88. So that's when I joined um did my thing, got out of the Corps, decided to move to New Jersey. I was born and raised in Virginia, so I decided to move to New Jersey. Uh I guess to check out what the communism I was fighting was about. And um Got up here and found out how stupid the gun laws are. They made it very difficult for you to even have a gun outside of your home with their purchasing permits and their uh, firearms ID card. You couldn't even go to the range. So um, Mm -hmm. fast forward till 2012, uh, where I got my uh, firearms ID card and decided to become a firearms instructor. Um, And Sandy Hook happened. Sandy Hook went down and all of a sudden my dreams of being the greatest firearms instructor in the world was going up in smoke because uh, the New Jersey legislator had legislation slate tours had 86 bills they were willing to pass and shove down our throats. And that's what started me in my activism and writing letters. And um, I went to testify for the first time in 2013, totally intimidated by the way they have everything set up. And I was the one pro-gun black guy to testify that day. Everybody else, no other people of color showed up. And after it was over, I spoke to the heads of some of the Second Amendment groups in Jersey and was like, hey, um, where are all the black people at? Like, do you have a, a program? Because it seems I was the only one in there and I know I've trained people of color. Do you have a program to invite these people in to become part of the political activism in the state? And all of them said no. So my friend Sean, who helped me start The Second is for Everyone, I mean, this was the conversation. Tony, why don't you do something? Mm-hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, no, uh, other people do stuff. I'm not doing stuff. And he was like, why don't you call Anthony Calandro, Gun for Higher Range? That's where I went and got, got my certifications at. Anthony's always willing to back minorities or just people in general doing stuff like that and activism in the state. So I called Anthony up. This is February 2015, the beginning of the month. And I said, Anthony, I'd like to put on an event that gets people, black people, to actually be part of the Second Amendment advocacy and also invite them in. He says, what about Thursday? I was like, what? He was like, what about Thursday? I'd just gotten on Facebook, man. I was like, give me a week. So I, I, I did a Facebook event and I learned a very important lesson. People that say they come into your event on Facebook, don't. So uh, we had four people show up out of the 30 something that said they were coming and um, we put it on and I called it the African American diversity shoot because it was done in February. And of course I got bombarded by emails from white people asking if white people could come. <laughs> I'm like, the second is for everybody. Diversity, yes, please come. So four black guys showed up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't, you didn't have like opportunistic white dudes going like, ah, oh, I want to. I'm comfortable. Look at my black friends. I'm comfortable no. with armed black people. And you know, I just. I by the way, Tony, I got I got to comment. I mean, you, you covered a lot of ground there. There's so many things I want to jump in on aside from how freaking old core you are, and you know, we, can, we can talk about that. <laughs> Yeah, what did, what did you do in 1988? You kept the communists out of Cleveland. Screw you! I was shooting, I was shooting Hajis in Iraq. So there. <coughs> um, but We're there yeah, the first time. Uh, <laughs> you, you talk, you talk about New Jersey. You you want to be the the best firearms instructor, and you're trying to do it in New Jersey. You know what? You know what most people do when they wake up to to, to freedom and, and and libertarianism in New Jersey. I know this because I've done surveys. 
Do what you know what people do when they wake up. Same thing in New York. You know what they do when they wake up there? What? They fucking leave. Yeah, it's like the status hell of America. Why would you want to be in that that tri-state area? Why would you want to be in the, the the belly of the beast of the gun control metropolis? No, screw that. Now, due respect, I understand there are still some gardens left in the Garden State. If there there are reasons to stay there, not a lot. Not there are more smokestacks than gardens, uh, and and there are more bad haircuts than gun owners. But that being said, you know, it, it, it makes it all the more noble what you're doing there. And I want to point out like about the, the sort of white posturing opportunism right now, because I do say that, you know, I'm not I'm not really a, a supporter of Black Lives Matter, but I'm an ally. You know, I see what they're doing that's challenging authority, that's taking back power to the people. And, and in that sense, those things, I support that, those elements of the movement and, and the general thrust of it. But uh, th there's something really important here where when, when, when black America is, is still in a period of historically coming back from the era of slavery and ongoing eras of overt oppression to now more covert oppression, perhaps you could say, uh, that, that black America is still in the process of finding its place and fully asserting itself. It's I, I as, a, as a white dude, and don't assume my, my, my ethnicity, I'm half Jewish, uh, the other half is German, so it's a very interesting internal dialogue I've got going here. But the, you know, as a as a white American, I want to say like, no, I I am sympathetic. I support black people asserting their rights. I support this, and it's not. And what what I think differentiates us most importantly from Republicans and Democrats is they say, well, Republicans, well, we want you to have good access to the police. You know, we're we're for, for Blue Lives Matter too. You know, okay. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we support the general continuation of the welfare system. And the Democrats say, we want more welfare. We want you more dependent and back on the plantation of government in a different way. And libertarians are sitting here going like, y'all should be armed. <laughs> uh, as far as Black Lives Matter is concerned, um, I support the sentiment being uh, owner of a black life. Uh, but as far as the organization, I have nothing to do with them. That has been hijacked long ago. So they can fuck right off. Um, <laughs> now, as far as, 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 as the political parties, same thing with Black Lives Matter. They can join them on the bus. Uh, they, neither party uh, is a hero. All right. Um, if the Republicans meant what they said, uh, fought a war to keep the country together and end slavery. I love that one. They fought a war to end slavery. Then how come um, civil rights legislation took another hundred years? If all men were created equal and you fought a war for it, how come that didn't kick in right after the war? So blow it out your butt. How far ahead would America be in every relation if you really meant all men were created equal? ending with the Civil War. Let's not drag it to the Revolutionary War where you said, oh my goodness, they wouldn't get the colonies to sign if they ended slavery. All right, cool. We just fought a war to end slavery. What happened? So no, no party's a good guy. Um, and let's never forget, the party of the Klan is a Democratic party. Uh, the president of the Confederacy was the Democrats. Everybody has mud and dirt on them and no, no political party is your friend. Grow up. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> now, on with the move out of Jersey. Not going to do it right now unless I get a good deal on some property in PA. I will leave. I'm totally willing to sell out. Understand uh, Bloomberg has $60 million he's willing to give to the anti-gun cause. I take cash. I, I take cash. I'm just saying. But it needs to be a significant portion of $60 million. No, I'm going to stay here in the fight because this is where the fight needs to be. Um, we cannot l allow anti-gun forces to have entire states to themselves. Uh, gun owners going to have to get off their butts. There's over a million red, uh, gun owners in New Jersey, or at least a million firearms ID cards out there. You're going to have to start voting for your rights. And I think COVID has given a lot of people a wake-up call that the government will not be there for you. And you're going to have to arm up. And now uh, Governor Murphy just decided that he wanted to raise fees on even being able to arm up. Uh, I think uh, went from two dollars for a permit fee to 50. He wants to raise it up to. And uh, for the license itself, I think it goes from five to 100. So that's what he's trying to do to your state. You're going to have to fight it. You're going to have to get off the butt, get out of your echo chambers on your iPad and on your phone 
and, and get out and actually vote and call your legislators and go to your local local meetings and scare the crap out of them like they did in Virginia. You're going to have to actually put in work. Freedom ain't free. That simple. Definitely. Well, I don't know if you had noticed, but while you were talking on that last stint, Adam Spro, uh, Adam's phone froze. So he's <laughs> connecting and reconnecting right now. But uh, I'm really enjoying everything you're saying. You said something about leaving. Uh, I agree with I'm a status here. Somebody said move to Florida, but I, I agree with I'm a status. Maybe it's because I live here. But he said Florida isn't as 2A friendly as Arizona. Only one of the only real 2A states is Arizona was what he's talking about. Florida's going through their own bull crap right now. Uh, my Florida per permit is being uh, delayed by their agricultural secretary who's in charge of a uh, permitting process. And she ran on the because um, it's an elected position. And she said she was all for gun control when she ran in the people of Florida elected her. So, no, no state, no state is pro gun every time an election come around. Oh, yeah. yeah, you're right. That's true. Good point. Adam, welcome back. Thanks. Sorry for the technical difficulties there. I am now in my backup studio where hopefully my phone won't overheat again. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of like the problems with an M16A1 with barrels overheating. If you send enough data through a Pixel 3 XL, eventually it tells you, no, the barrel's too hot and you got to stop. Uh, so thanks for bearing with me there, Tony. Uh, I appreciate the historical perspective on that, but let's get forward it, it, into uh, what you're doing right now with Second Amendment is for everyone. First of all, the brand. Br obviously, genius branding. How did you come up with that, and how is that serving you? <laughs> okay, I can come up with some bullcrap way of... Um saying that I came up with the branding that was like ingenious, but it was just me and my best friend on the phone talking about how to get something that people understand, how to get something that people like. And I'm like, everybody likes seconds. <laughs> when it comes right. to eating, everyone likes seconds. So the second is for everyone. It was just that we were really trying to come up with something that said something. And when we hit it, we were like, okay. And then we had to come up with the 2A4E and the American flag kind of logo. I wanted something non-offensive as a logo that can be a conversation starter if you wanted it to be. Uh, I could have had something with guns crossed or anything like that, but that could have started your conversation off on the wrong foot, more confrontational. And what I want to do is actually have people have conversations again. You don't even have to agree, but you, at least you can converse. And that's what this is about, opening doors, talking to people that aren't in my political perspective spectrum or even believe in what I believe in. And, and I find that's a better way to do this instead of being controversial. Just talk to them. And there's other ways to do it. This is just the way my personality is. I want people to join us. I invite people, no matter their religion, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, come out, come to the range with us. We, we have a meeting. We talk. We ask que answer questions. I invite Second Amendment advocacy groups from all over, and um, you have a conversation with normal people in a room. We bring in food, we have fun, um, and then we go out and shoot guns together, and you can just have that conversation and ask those questions you can't to the people at work, or you can't to the rabid a-holes that, that lurk on social media that will attack you. Like when you say, well, why can't we have a compromise? Well, if you say that online, you know, cold dead hands and, and a lot of other bumper sticker logic, when you say that in the room with us, we'll converse with you and tell you how we have uh, compromised since 1936 and what it was like to actually open a Sears catalog and go, I want that belt fed and have it dropped off at your house. <laughs> We've come a long way. So that's the kind of conversation we have to bring people in. You can't shove your rights down people's throats, even if it's something that everyone should have a right to. So in terms of the messaging for this, you, you, do, uh, you do several podcasts and you're able to, to interact with a, a broader audience that way. Uh, what's, what's the pushback? And does, does, what, does your mess, like, this is something that I thought was really important from talking to uh, to Ernie Hancock about what you're doing and the messaging, and it's the kind of thing where when he, when he heard it, 
Second Amendment is for everyone. You go, oh, yeah. Like how there's so much packed into that 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 we as libertarians really want to help be communicated that it's not well. I have a right to own guns and this is how I want to defend my house and I want to go hunting. And so I have that right. And I was like, no, no, it's for everyone. Not just everyone deserves a safer community. Everyone deserves uh, uh, their, their right to defend themselves how they see fit. You know, everyone deserves the in inherent rights that, that we're talking about here and everybody benefits from a society that respects them. So when you get challenges, cause I know you're out there. I mean, obviously uh, you know, you get you get to play the race card, right? Which is really fun. <laughs> uh, like, like, you know, how can a, how can a white person like? And I love this. Like, it, it, I'm, I I hate to play, you know, identity politics bullshit games. But the reality is, if if I'm talking to uh, a, a white liberal who's trying to make some greater good argument about why gun control is necessary, and and you know, I, I can say, well. What about this and this? And I can argue it in the abstract, but then a black dude shows up and goes, you want to disarm me? Uh -huh. After everything after everything my people have been through in this country, you want to disarm me? <laughs> well, I think my, my, my first line that blows people away is I was born in 1970, two years after the last civil rights legislation was signed. So I am the first generation of black person born in this country with all the same rights as a white person. Nothing had to be legislated. It was, we were equal finally, 1968. All right, I'm that first generation. Why are you trying to take, this not some black and white, this is a dude standing in front of you. This is no old time real to real. This isn't back in slavery. These rights have only been here. I was born with the same rights as you and that's only been real since 1968, it's 50, 52 years. Why would I ever give up that right to make yeah, yeah. you feel better? Yeah, if, if I may just jump in for a second on the historical note there, this is, you know, and I, by the way, I think the drinking game for our show is going to be every time Adam says, as a libertarian, you have to take a, a <laughs> shot or a toast. Like, and I keep sort of jumping in with it, but like, uh, you know, as, now I forgot what I was going to say. No, but as a libertarian, when we look at the history, it's not enough to say history has been whitewashed. We need to tell the real story but to recognize the general impact of that whitewashing of history, which gives the average modern American going through a government school system with the government textbook, the impression of the story being, oh yeah, things were fucked up, but yeah, we fixed it and things are pretty good now. And <laughs> yeah, everybody's getting along. And it's like, no, no, your parents did this shit. Maybe not your parents, but your parents' generation, like and me, I'm 38, you know, and I grew up, in you know you want to talk about like you know going to high school before the year 2000 and i'm not as my parents were great people neither of them are, are at, at all responsible for any racism at all yeah. of course but, no, but generally <laughs> speaking i'm not talking about my parents because they're probably going to watch this and be like wait a second uh but no i was like i was born in 82 my parents were born you know 20 to 40 years i, I'm, I shouldn't even reveal their ages they're going to be offended by that too but no, <laughs> even that generate you just go back just do the math america like do the math and maybe if you're in high school today it's not your parents but it's your grandparents i your went to school generation did that shit yeah i went to school with the guys whose parents uh, did that we drove past a house with the tree in front of it and i still remember my uncle telling me this 1969, a man was hung from that tree. A black man was hung from that tree for waving at a white woman. This is where my school bus went um, past every day since I went to school. This is not some not living history. They surrounded this man's house, forced him to come outside. They said either they burned the house down with his family inside or he comes outside. They hung him. They hung him in the tree in front of his family. And I sit there now as an adult, because as a kid, it was a horror story. And, and one of the things was like, well, why didn't they call the police? And my uncle said, what makes you think they weren't? And my uncle said, what makes you think they weren't there? And, 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 and when you try to talk to somebody about that, when you come from that history and they have the audacity to say, oh, that can't happen today. Or what did this kid who is uh, dating a relative of mine tell me one day, white kid sitting down at the table with me goes, race relations are worse now in America than ever before. Uh, uh, <laughs> that, that was my look. 
And then I was trying to be cool, and I'm like, listen, he's a young man. He's a I'm like, where? Where? <laughs> what part of history are you talking about? Let me explain something. As a black man in America, if there was a such thing as a hot tub time machine, I would put it on the limit is like 1991. That's as far back as we can go. Anyway, other than that, no, I'm not going in American history. <laughs> Screw you. Uh, hammer pants, that was it. Once we get past that, we got a problem. So, well, no. You know, you you know, well, I, I gotta say, even going back to 19, I wouldn't want to go back at all. I mean, humanity progresses, things get better, and yeah, two steps forward, one step backwards. But uh, 1991 was pre-internet in the United States. Effectively, yeah, there was internet, but it wasn't widespread. There wasn't Facebook. People didn't have access. You didn't have smartphones. Uh, people didn't have cameras, video cameras connected to the rest of humanity in their pockets. I mean, you you want to talk about like it, it's one of those things like. Uh, you know, do, do we need governments to make whaling illegal to save the whales? No, we need Thomas Edison to invent electricity so we stop needing whale blubber for lanterns, right? You know, do we do we do we need an, an increased, uh, you know, sympathy for Black America? Yeah, we still do. I'm not saying like you, you do that, that that's you know where it needs to be, but what, maybe maybe Apple, may, you know, maybe Steve Jobs has done more for reducing police brutality against black Americans than any individual activist had because of that technological development. But now as I say, the technology means nothing without deliberate conscientious use. And you know, uh, Tony, we wanna have you back on uh, next week when we get this panel together talking about gun rights and, and what's going on in 2020 right now, you know, where we are with, with Corona and the laws like that. But, you know, without getting into too much of like, you know, what's right right now, because things are kind of crazy yeah. with especially the shooting in Kenosha. Uh, where do you see your role and 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 the voice of, of 2A4E, Second Amendment for everyone in the gun conversation in America right now? Right now, I really feel that we need to start talking to each other instead of at each other. That's very important. So the role is we need to start welcoming people in that come from different political backgrounds. Understand that your rights and the right, regardless of what it is, extends to everyone, even if you don't agree with them. But you got to start talking. And if we don't, we're going to have this us against them mentality that, sorry, but as firearms owners, we're outnumbered. Um, in the media uh, and in what, what's projected, we have all of that against us. We have to turn that around by welcoming people in that before you might not have even seen um, when I host my events, a lot of Latinos, a lot of blacks, a lot of Asians come to our events. Why? Because you need someone, anyone, and in this case, it's myself and the group that I run, um, that invites them to these ranges. And all of a sudden you see people that look like you and now you start shooting and now you start talking to the second amendment advocacy groups that most people don't know exist. Most people only know the NRA. Well, there are a lot of other groups, especially local groups. And not only do they fight local laws, but they get people together again to see you're on the same page because divisiveness is what powers that be are using to tear this country apart in any means necessary. And what we do at the diversity shoot is bring the people together and let them see you have a lot more in common than you don't have in common. And there are people profiteering off of that divide. Beautiful. So well said. And that's it for everyone. The inclusiveness of your message is so beautiful and so important. I'm really glad that you're out there. I, I hope that uh, people in our audience can support you. I get behind your organization. So finally, what, what's your website? How can people connect with you? You can contact me at diversityshoot.com. Tony at diversityshoot.com is my email. Um, every way you can donate, it's on our website. <laughs> nice. Uh, you can um, donate on our website through uh, Patreon, which we have giveaways. So far, we've given away one, two, three firearms, four firearms this year. Um, we give away knives. We give away stuff like that. And your funds help me put these events on stress-free so I don't have to worry about how many butts I put in seats. We just had our first event in Pennsylvania this year because of New Jersey uh, still has rain, shut down to 25% capacity. So you can't, we can't have an event in Jersey and still have the rain staff there. So instead, 
I've moved across the border to PA and we're running things out of the Heritage Guild. They opened their arms up to us and we had our first event last week because they will not stop what we're doing because I feel it's very, very important. And you can support me, of course, by going to diversityshoot.com on Simon Says Train on Instagram. And the second is for everyone on Facebook. That helps. And of course, the podcast, the 2A4E podcast on your favorite podcast app. Awesome. Tony, you're doing amazing work, and, and I'm just I'm grateful that your voice is out there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it.